Well, good evening, everybody. Is everybody ready for Christmas? That's what I expected to hear. Neither am I. So uh, welcome. Good to have you here tonight. Welcome to all those who are joining us at, uh, in the homes and on the Internet. So uh, tonight we're going to speak on revival. I've titled this study, Five Marks of Revival, out of Nehemiah chapter 9. Are you enjoying Nehemiah? Yeah, it's a great, great book. Amen. So I'm reminded of this story of uh, these three friends that all die in a car crash together, and they go to heaven for orientation. You know, apparently there is orientation when we go to heaven. I, I don't know where that is in Scripture, but I'm just taking this at face value. And they were all asked the same question. They were asked that when the people file by and look at you in the casket, your family and your friends, what would you like to hear them say about you? So the first guy says, well, I'd like to hear them say that he was a really good doctor. And, uh, and on top of that, just a really great guy. Nice man. Next guy says, well, I'd, I'd like them to, to hear them say that he was an excellent school teacher. And he impacted the lives of many, many young children. And it gets to the third guy and... He thinks for a second, and uh, they say, what would you like, what would you like to hear them say about you? And he says, I'd like to hear them say, look, he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what's happening in the life of the children of Israel here in Nehemiah. They're coming back to life spiritually. They're moving. It's a story of revival. You know, for 70 years of their captivity, the people of God had no place to call home. Their spiritual life was dead. All of their customs and their traditions, everything that centered their Jewish life was built around the temple, which they no longer had. The laws, the sacrifices, the annual festivals all served to build a culture that gave them boundaries for living and gave purpose to their lives. All that had been taken away at the captivity and all their godly disciplines had been undone. They were subjects to a godless empire and the garbage of the worldliness that polluted this Jewish race and they were scarcely recognizable as people set apart for God kind of reminds me of a little bit of what we're experiencing in our time, doesn't it? Our nation has seemingly been taken captive by worldly forces. Our Christian culture that once permeated all of America has been shoved off into silos and groups, a group of people known as evangelicals. That's what we are. Now we're just a voting block. <laughs> Where Christianity used to dominate and shape our culture and our values, from defining marriage and family to defining what was moral and what's immoral, that's no longer the case, is it? You know, several years back, Rolling Stone, the magazine, did a survey on what was the greatest rock and roll song ever. And uh, it came back, interestingly, uh, a song by which they named their magazine, Bob Dylan's like a rolling stone. How does it feel to be on your own, a complete unknown, like a rolling stone? No direction home. That's us, isn't it? No direction home. If we learn anything from Nehemiah, we learn that God's people always have a direction home. And this is a story about their regathering, about a faithful remnant a remnant of faithful believers 
set apart for his eternal purposes, set apart to honor him and his ways, set apart to uphold the word of God and the life of faith. So the building of these walls that we've been studying by Nehemiah and by Ezra and the people were the first signs of resurrection, of revival. And once those walls were up, their identity began to be restored and the word of God was read and they began to experience personal revival. Now history reveals, as we all know, that they would be scattered again following Christ's first coming and ushering in the church age, which we're in now. But we know that there's a regathering again of Israel it's already begun in preparation for Christ's second coming. But the lessons that we learn from Nehemiah's regathering at this time, the seeds of personal revival, we can see happening right here in Jerusalem. And it tells us how we can rebuild and maintain the spiritual walls of our faith when all around us, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Outlined in these first six verses are five marks of revival, both personal and national. And they could all be grouped under the heading consecration or sanctification. These are words we don't hear frequently any longer, but they are the key disciplines of a godly life. Uh, you know, I remember growing up in the Lutheran church and we sang a hymn that went this way, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. And take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Remember that, that song? That's consecration, a life devoted completely and totally to the Lord. To be consecrated or sanctified literally means to be set apart for divine purpose. And it's this setting aside of our own goals and ambitions to have them replaced by God's plans and purposes for our life that we see happening here and that need to happen in our lives. It's putting God in his rightful place in our lives. And all of that can be summed up in the opening sentence of the prayer that we find starting in verse 6 that makes up the bulk of this chapter. In fact, it's the longest prayer in, in the scriptures. And it says, Then he prayed, May your glorious name be praised. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. That's underlined. You alone are the Lord. That's what they were acknowledging as a people. And then the entire prayer is a recitation of how God was good to them and gracious to them all throughout their history as a people, even in the face of their own disobedience and unwillingness to follow his plans, yet God remained faithful to them and merciful. And on this day that they are celebrating they're moving God back onto his rightful throne at the center of their personal and national life. Oh, that we would see that happen in America. Amen? Would we, what a day that would be if America would turn back to God and begin to celebrate him and put him back on the throne of our national life. But it first must happen with you and I. And so that's what we need to take away. These five marks of personal revival that we find in the first five verses are these. You can write these down. This is our outline for tonight. Cessation, separation, declaration, illumination, adoration. I'll go over them again. Cessation, separation, declaration, illumination, and adoration. Let's read. On October 31st, the people assembled again, and this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled 
dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord their God was read aloud to them. And then for three more hours they confessed their sins and worshiped the Lord their God. Then the leaders of the Levites called out to the people, stand up and praise the Lord your God for he lives from everlasting to everlasting. I skipped over a bunch of names just to save myself embarrassment, but you get the point. They fasted. They, conf- they separated themselves. They confessed their sins. They read the book of the law, and they praised the Lord. There was cessation, separation, declaration, illumination, and adoration. Let's begin with cessation. What were they ceasing? It was, there was cessation from personal gratification. In, back in chapter 8, when they were reading the Word of God or having it read to them for the first time, it became immediately obvious to them that they had blown it big time, that they had left God's perfect plan for them. In Nehemiah, it says here in chapter 8, Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites who were interpreting for the people said to them, Don't mourn or weep on such a day as this, for today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah continued, Go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks, and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared, And this is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad, for the Lord, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So what's happening here? Well, it's obvious that God's people had completely departed from God's purposes and plans. And now as the word of God is read to them in chapter 8, we see them beginning to mourn and weep over their condition. But Nehemiah and Ezra say, wait a minute, hold on. There will be reforms coming. There will be a day when we will fast and weep. But right now, we're to be celebrating, according to the word, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so let's do this first, because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And though they had failed and offended God for many years, Nehemiah encouraged them to engage in this Feast of Tabernacles, to enjoy one another's fellowship, basically to have a party and celebrate what God intended for them. Look, God's laws aren't given to make us miserable. They're given to make us mighty. And that's what was happening here. God's word doesn't put us in a cage to keep us from freedom. It surrounds us with condition. He surrounds us with conditions that protect us from our enemies and from ourself. You know, I have a little dog that I take on a walk every night. And there are times I let him run free when I know that there's no issues around that and he can harm himself. But most of the time I keep him on a leash for his own sake. Because if he just follows his nose, he's going to get in trouble. And, uh, and so I put that, and that's what God's word is for us. It's, it keeps us out of trouble. It keeps us within God's purview of our plans for our lives. His disciplines, his plans for us bring peaceable fruit in our lives. That's what discipline does. You know, we discipline our children, and it says it brings the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, present, Hebrews says, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That's what the Word of God does for us, and it's what it does for a people if they follow it. So after this feast, after they enjoy this time, then Nehemiah says, okay, now, now it's time to fast and to mourn in sackcloth and ashes. You know, fasting was a form of self-punishment. It was a recognition of sin and a way of mourning and grieving for their disobedience, for their condition. And so they began to focus on ceasing from their physical 
needs in order to focus on the Word of God, on confession, and on praise. That's where the cessation was. It was self-denial. Denying themselves. You know, Jesus taught on self-denial, didn't he? If any man come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. You see, the on-ramp to sanctification began with cessation. You know, I love that opening sentence in uh, Pastor Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. You know what it is? It's not about you. <laughs> That's a brilliant opening line. It's not about you. You know, I was raised in a home where we went to church every week. I was baptized. I was confirmed in the faith. But in many ways, the religion just inoculated me to the truth of my condition, that I was still a sinner, and I had to really understand that. Life was still all about me, even though I was in church. If I was to live as a Christian, I realized I needed to repent from my sin. I needed to put God back on the throne and to seek his plan for my life. I needed to take a back seat and let him be the driver. The first thing that Nehemiah wanted to establish was the people, for his people, was that they needed to cease from their feasting now and focus on fasting, self-denial. It would be the on-ramp to the road of their sanctification. Now, the next mark of personal revival is separation. Nehemiah asked them to separate themselves from the foreigners that lived among them. In some cases, this actually meant that the husbands had to separate from their pagan wives that they had taken in the land. It was an attempt to kind of unmix the mixed multitude, like, kind of almost like unscrambling an egg. It was not an easy task. Now, you'll recall back in Joshua, uh, when Israel first came into the land, they were told not to intermarry with pagan peoples that lived there. They were foreigners, and God wanted to keep his people separate for his purposes and his plans. But you'll remember in Joshua 9, the Gibeonites came in and they tricked Joshua. They said, oh, we're, we're from a far off land. We don't, we're not from here. And they had moldy bread and they had, you know, worn out shoes that they brought to kind of prove that they were from far away. But it was all a ruse. It was all a lie. They were people of the land. And so Joshua made this league with them and they ended up intermarrying exactly what God didn't want for his people. The separation was ruined. Look, there is a blessing when we honor God's intended plans for us and to do things God's way. You know, you might be surprised to know that uh, when we come across couples in the church that, that are um, married, out of wedlock, you know, we ask them to separate. We, we say, you know, honor God's way. God's way is that you shouldn't be living together out of wedlock. Separate for a time, get married, come back, do it God's way, and he'll bless your marriage. And uh, it's amazing when people do that, how they, they, they do sense that, that great blessing of God on their life. We're not to be yoked with the world. We need to stand apart, set apart from the world. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 tells us, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? And he goes on to say, be ye separate. As Christians, we're to maintain separation from the world's ways. That doesn't mean that we don't have friends in the world or we don't mix with non-believers. It simply means that when we interact with them, we don't affirm their sin or their crude jokes or their sexual innuendo. We keep ourselves separate from that. We should have friends in the world as long as we don't make friends with the world. And upon becoming a believer, our separation must be made complete. We need to move away, move in different circles because we're changed. God wants us to maintain that separation, to be separate, set apart for him. And if we're to be set apart, we must stand apart from the world. Now, one way to stand apart is to confess our sins publicly. And that's our third one. 
declaration, confession of sin. We learn in the scriptures, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession of sin is an integral part in making a commitment to Christ, isn't it? It's what we do when we respond to the gospel. And Nehemiah is encouraging confession here. So much so that they spent three hours confessing their sins. They spent as much time confessing their sin as they did hearing the word read to them. I wonder how our lives might be altered if we did the same, if we spent as much time confessing our sin as we did reading God's word. Have you ever spent time just thinking about all the sins that you've done that day and kind of recite them in your mind? Now we can overdo this. Uh, if you've read the book uh, on Luther that Eric Metaxas spoke about, and he, he mentioned this in his message, you know, Luther would try to confess every sin he could think of as he was, you know, before he really understood the grace of God. And so he can come back day after day after day, many times in the day, I remembered another sin. I have this little sin, this thought, this action. Finally, the guy he was confessing to all this, said, stop, come back when you've really done something sinful, <laughs> you know. And uh, so we don't want to overdo it, but it's, a, you know, we need to think about those areas and be aware of our sin and to confess it. There's a movement in the church today to avoid doing public invitations to receive Christ, to altar calls, the way we call people forward. You know, that is a, a mark of confession. It's a public confession of sin that's happening. It's a, a declaration to everybody who's watching that I'm a sinner and I need Christ's forgiveness. I, I liken it to the marriage ceremony even. You know, when people get married here in the church, uh, we understand that it's a legal contract. And, and actually, we have witnesses that sign the document. You know, the pastor who performs the ceremony signs it, but then the witnesses sign it. We witnessed this declaration of commitment between these two people. And the same thing is happening when people make a public profession of their faith. It's, a, it's like making a contract. It's making it known. I think baptism can be in the same way, a, a way of publicly declaring your faith. But some in the church, as I said, want to avoid this. They, they would say, well, it's like marriage. You know, you, you can have a common law marriage. You don't have to have it uh, ratified by the government. You can still love one another and be committed to one another. That's true. You can have that. But you know, your marriage is strengthened when you have that commitment that is public and that is ratified by others who've witnessed it. The same is true in our faith. When we make a public declaration, our faith is strengthened by that. And so we don't want to encourage common law Christians I think it's great to see people making a public profession of, that, of, of their faith. It also provides a release of guilt of our sin, practice of confession. Um, that's why we're exhorted to confess our sins one to another. And I think it also helps us to embrace God's forgiveness as we gain accountability uh, of the, to the people that we're confessing to accountability to keep us from those sins. I ran across last week a, a great story of confession of sin and um, just how I think it's a reason we do what Pastor Greg does in providing people an opportunity. And it's a story of a, a guy, a man named Paul and his wife who got saved at a harvest crusade years ago. They got saved, and then they moved to Fort Worth, Texas, and they began a family. They had two children, um, the daughter and a son, and the daughter was the younger one. At age 12, 
their daughter was raped. Parents didn't know about it until a year later. And they started noticing their young daughter's life spiraling downward. She'd been very involved in the church before this and was just, a, you know, had a lovely, bright future. But now she was depressed, lashing out, lost all interest in the things of God. Her parents prayed for her, counseled with her, got her psychiatric help even. Then at the age of 14, this girl's best friend committed suicide. And she went further down and she began drinking and doing drugs and uh, being promiscuous. Uh, at one time, he said that there were men, 40-year-old men coming to his door looking for his daughter. He would pray so hard for her that he said the carpet on his, in his bedroom was wet. He had to close the door so his wife wouldn't hear him sobbing. By 16, she was running away, deeper into drugs and rebellion. One night, she stole her father's pickup to go joyriding with some of her friends. They had an accident. One of those friends was killed. Then along comes Harvest America at AT&T Stadium. Well, her parents, being involved in the church, immediately signed up. They were going to be follow-up counselors. And so they did that. They were on the field, and they went into the back room where we do the card sorting. If you've ever been a part of that, I would just, it's such a great place to go and witness. So see all of these cards being gathered of people's lives that have been changed, responding to the invitation that Greg has given at the crusade. There's, he's standing there, and one of the cards flips over, and whose name is on it? His daughter. He's just, you know, blown away. His daughter. He didn't, you know, he didn't see this coming. He, she was a total surprise to him. And uh, so she made this public confession in front of all of these people. And then, you know, she, like most Christians, had those worldly friends that were influencing her. And she was able to get connected with Teen Challenge. And they were able to help her with her addictions. And now today she's walking with God. The public... She, the public confession was triggered at Harvest America, but her sanctification was continued through Teen Challenge and, and the church she was a part of and is a part of. It's just a wonderful thing to be able to make that public profession of our faith. But it's also not just the personal sins that we see here, but it was also the sins of their nation. Uh, you know, America's sins are by association our sins as well because it's our country. And that's why we should be praying for revival and, and caring enough for our country to repent of the sins of our nation. Second, Corinthians, or Second Chronicles 7.14, as you all know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. If my people, it's up to you and I, to begin that personal revival. Next, there is illumination, a commitment to God's word, to obey God's word. Thy word, the psalmist says, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Nehemiah and Ezra sought to put their nation back onto a path of righteousness. And that path was illuminated by God's word. The law, which was read for three hours, gave them concrete answers and truth. God's word to them and to us is like a mirror that we hold up to our lives, and it reveals who we really are. And this truth, that as they're hearing God's word, it brought truth and conviction, and conviction brought change. And that's what needs to happen in our personal lives, but in our nation, too. We must hold fast to 
God's word and to its truth and putting it forward as the only source of truth and the primary source of truth and life for our personal lives and for our nation. Did you know that right now, Pastor Greg sent me an article the other day that Franklin Graham, who's wanting to go and do a, an outreach, a gospel outreach in the United Kingdom, in England, and he's being opposed by a group of people, some of which are pastors and leaders in the church, and uh, he's being opposed because of what they call hate speech, because he's spoken about how the Bible teaches against homosexuality and because he has stated publicly that Islam is a wicked religion. And because of those things, they want to ban him from coming in and proclaiming the gospel. That's, a, that's how far we've, they've come in the UK, but guess what? That's the direction we're going. And it's because there is no line drawn on the word of God there. They've accepted the idea that, that as a believer in the Bible, uh, you're believing in fairy tales, basically. And uh, they don't accept the, the truth of God's word. We must hold fast to that truth. Uh, the battleground, it's the battleground for our nation. And the formation of family design and sexual design and moral values, these aren't our ideas. They're ideas God's word teaches. We don't hate homosexuals because they choose to follow a different set of values, but we can't change our values to accommodate their alternative lifestyle either. And so we hold fast to God's word and what it says. We simply choose to follow God's designs and to live our lives according to what the scriptures say. Will we do it perfectly or will we do it without hypocrisy? No. We avoid sex outside of marriage because God's word says we should. We believe marriage to be between one man and one woman because God's word says it's so. We avoid drug and alcohol abuse because God's word says we shouldn't be brought under the power of anything other than the Holy Spirit. We avoid foul language and dirty jokes because God's word says that we should avoid coarse jesting and taking his name in vain. You see, God's word is a light unto our path. It gives concrete answers for living. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It tells us who God is. For reproof. It tells us when we are getting off base. For correction, it tells us how to get back on path. And for instruction in righteous living, it tells us how to be holy men and women of God. That the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need to hold fast to the word of God. And that's what was changing the lives of these men and women in Nehemiah's day. The final mark of personal revival is that of adoration in worship. It was a, an extension of the joy that they were experiencing. But it was and is a discipline as well. A verbal acknowledgement of God's goodness and grace. That's something that should be a part of our lives whether we're living on uh, Happy Street when there's money in the bank and everything's well and everybody's healthy or whether we're on a downtime where things are difficult. We should be able to praise God and give him adoration and the honor do his name. When we worship in church, some days, if you're like me, you just don't feel like it, right? But if we discipline ourselves to enter into that time of worship and to give God his due, seems to change and lift your heart and that's why we must continue it. I came across a, a man last week who we'd met the first time around in Dallas and uh, in fact he, he's written a book called Unshackled. His name's Gene McGuire and Pastor Greg wrote a foreword for this book and um, at 17 years old 
he was uh, taken to a, a bar with his, by his older cousin. And his older cousin decided to rob that bar as they were leaving. And while the young man, Gene, was out in the car, his older cousin went in, robbed that, that bar, and murdered the, the uh, owner. They fled. He took the 17-year-old Gene with him. And when they were caught, they were both obviously thrown in prison. And, and, um, and the judge at his trial uh, gave Gene a, a uh, life sentence without the possibility of parole for doing or being a part, an accessory to murder that he didn't commit. Of course, he wasn't a believer at the time. He got into prison. He, he got further into a horrible lifestyle, doing drugs in prison and learning the system and gaming it as best he could. And um, 12 years into his sentence, a man, a Christian, came into that prison and began to minister to him, led him to Christ. He had a tremendous life change. He began serving in the chapel. He became a model prisoner. But because he was not given the opportunity to get parole, he needed to have a commutation of his sentence. And um, so after years went by, he uh, finally got the opportunity to have a commutation. He went before that uh, agency to that issues that and they denied him even though he was obviously a changed man well on the way back to his cell God spoke to him he says he said God told him worship me give me praise despite your circumstances honor me he went back to his cell and he did that this happened several times, and every time he was denied, he'd go back to his cell and give God praise. Finally, he was given a commutation and now allowed to go before the parole board. And he went before the parole board, the same thing happened. They denied him. Now he's been in prison for well over 20-some years. And every time he goes back, he's denied and God tells him when he gets back into his cell, give me praise. Give me adoration. Give me the honor due my name. And he does. He praises God despite his circumstances. 34 years go by before he gets released. And a judge finally hears his circumstances and releases him. 34 years. And yet, in all that time, he never flashed out at God. He gave him praise and gave him honor. That is the mark of revival. That's really the final mark of revival that says God is working in our lives. And we can do that. When we can praise him at the top and we can praise him at the bottom. Today, he works as a chaplain. You've heard Greg, Pastor Greg talk about the chicken place in in Dallas, the best fried chicken. Well, that, the owner of that restaurant hired Gene to be a chaplain to his some 1,200 employees that work for him. And so he goes around and he ministers to them today. God is faithful. If we'll be faithful to him, to give him praise, to give him honor, Let's do his name. Amen? So we honor him. We cease from our, our own ambitions. We deny ourselves. We separate ourselves from the world. We walk independent. We commit ourselves to God's word. And uh, we praise him with all of our being. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can stand before you and confess our sin and to know that we can be forgiven. Lord, thank you for reviving us. Lord, help us to be the people you want us to become. So, Lord, we commit our lives to you 
afresh today. And Lord, whether we be in great circumstances or in lousy circumstances, Father, we want to praise you because you are worthy of our praise. So Lord, bless the remainder of our evening now in Jesus' name. Amen.